Um, so anyway, we this was our first experience with stunts and special effects, and there were four different, you know, bits involving stunts and effects. And so we decided that the best, you know, uh, financially, the best way to do that was to shoot them all on the same day. And um, the the last of the four was being shot in Rick Pepin's mother-in-law's house, Angie Tondo, who also owned the restaurant that was in the movie where we shot somebody. Um, and by the end of it, we had been shooting for 23 hours. <laughs> and we over the effects guy overfilled the blood packs um, of those people in that house, which part of that scene you're talking about with Gene Levine and the shotgun, that was Angie's house. And years later, years later, Angie would say, you know, I found blood inside one of the cabinets today, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, under uh, under the cabinet, inside. And it, I mean, there was just blood everywhere in that house. And I remember being on my hands and knees, you know, after 23 hours, mopping up blood, saying to the first AD who was helping me, uh, you know, is, is is this the glitter or the glamour of the movie? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Laurel Fest, actually, she was the script supervisor from the early days up until um, God knows how long. Laurel was telling me a story, um, a story that was actually relayed to her through Joe um, that said that when he and Rick were making Hollywood in Trouble, Joe would want to let people off after eight hours, and it was Rick that had to kind of tell him, hey, it's uh, 12 hours. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. And again, you know, just we didn't know, you know. Um, there was so much we didn't know. Um, and I guess uh, making nine movies in a year or whatever the hell you guys managed to crank out was the best learning experience you could actually have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, you know, the uh, also the post process back then, um, you know, this was before there were avids. Um, so the, the movies were um, edited on video. And uh, we actually had to, the, the, I don't want to get into too arcane descriptions of, of editing, but every shot had these key numbers in little windows. Um, you know, when you edit. And we literally had to write those numbers down by hand oh. every single shot. It was, it was, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> I had no idea that you guys had to go to such measures for a City Lights movie. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about a movie that I just watched the other night that no one actually listened to, I'm sure, has ever seen. Um, the Glass Jungle which featured the boxer, um, what was his name? Uh, Lee Canalito, who yeah. had a very good professional record and managed to get a role in Paradise Alley with Sylvester Stallone. And then his two roles in PM Entertainment movies were pretty much the last of his film career. Yeah, and, and um, you know, this was... Um... You know, to satisfy the, the foreign market, uh, they wanted two things, you know, action and names. <laughs> and this was an attempt at, huh, you know, well, maybe the foreign market watches boxing, or we can always say, you know, he starred with Sylvester Stallone in this movie, uh, you know, uh, Paradise Alley or whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that was the idea um, behind casting him. Um, uh, not a very good actor, to say the least. Um, that movie features so many um, sad, dreamy montages of Lee Canalito making out with his uh, his woman. You know, um, this was another discovery of Joe's around that time was, uh, boy, you can fill, you know, two or three minutes at a time with a piece of music... And, um, you know, it, it's much faster to shoot things that don't involve dialogue because, you know, those pesky sound men always want it to be quiet when, when you're trying to, you know, <laughs> record sound. But if you just have, 
you know, Pam Dixon pushing a shopping cart through a grocery store for a couple of minutes with a piece of music, you know, you filled up a couple of minutes of the movie. Those are always great. So, yeah, you find as the movies went on, they had more and more of those montages. <laughs> and one of the things I think you mentioned to me in the past was that as time went on, the foreign buyers also wanted more inventive ways of people being killed because – all you had for movies and movies was squibs getting blown, squibs getting blown. And oh, yeah. Glass Jungle actually features the villain being killed by a miniature crossbow. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's one of those early films where it was a, uh, a, <laughs> a scuba spear. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, somehow this guy just happened to have this scuba <laughs> spear, you know, in his living room. Uh, you know, I mean, you could always justify, uh, gee, honey, are you going on a scuba diving trip next week? You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was really laughable, but yes, they, they, uh, we called it, uh, <clears throat> you, um, sometimes in the script it would say, you know, uh, he breaks into the house and kills nine guys in new and interesting ways. <laughs> <laughs> That is like that's got to be like the headline for all my PM entertainment coverage. Just an actual page from a script that says gets into a house and kills people in nine inventive ways. Yeah. yeah. Uh I mean that was the other thing about the script that we had is um I did a movie much later called Deadly Bet. And when I was given the script, it was 42 pages long. <laughs> and the ent- if if you see the movie, the last thirty minutes of the current movie was encapsulated with the line, "He goes to the tournament and wins." <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, the scripts were often very sparse. <laughs> um, and Deadly Bet is actually a fine, fine film that is available on DVD. It's with the great Jeff Wincott, who I've tried to mention on this show a few times. Jeff was very good. Um, Stephen Vincent Lee uh, was in that, Charlene Tilton. Uh, that that was actually a, a fun film for me to do, although the the first, you know, there's just like a million fights in a ring in that movie, and the first... Um, stuff that we shot we shot in one of the warehouses there in van nuys um in july and it you know was like 120 degrees in that ring we have this big light over the ring and it was a hundred some degrees outside so the first few days were pretty awful but uh, but i had a lot of fun on that movie and so while we're in the game of talking about your directing Let's talk a little bit about your directorial debut. The first non-Joseph Mayer he directed City Lights movie, Dance or Die. Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> must we talk about it? Oh, we uh, must. Yeah. You know, um, uh, well, as I say, you know, we had just been cranking out all these movies, and he told me I was going to get the opportunity to do a film. So in between all this other stuff, I had to come up with a script. And um, I I was interested in doing something that had dance in it because I had um, one of the early ADs, for uh, like on Mayhem, and a lot of the early movies, the first AD was uh, a a very big choreographer and director in Las Vegas named Minnie Madden. And um, she later went on to um, be vice president of Ice ice Capades and got into ice. But um, uh, anyway, we had been partnered doing shows for Japan where we would send, you know, six or eight dancers and a singer or whatever to Japan, and they would do these resort hotels there. And uh, so I was interested in dance, so I thought, all right, action, throw in some dancers, you know, oh, that was another part of the formula was you always had to have, you know, some amount of good-looking women and nudity. Of course. Uh, along with the action sequences. Um, so, yeah, anyway, I came up with uh, Dance or Die, and um, uh, I wanted to shoot it in Las Vegas just for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, at that time, if you went, if you went to a grocery store in – Los Angeles, and said, we'd like to shoot in your grocery store. They would say, okay, it's $600 an hour. 
Ugh. If you went anywhere else out, out of Los Angeles and said, you know, uh, we want to shoot in your grocery store, they would say, oh, great. Do you want us to close it for you? Do you, <laughs> do you want our employees to come in and help? Uh, you know, and, and, it, and it would be completely free. So I knew I could get a lot of stuff for free in Las Vegas. Um, the downside of it was I would lose a travel day. Uh, uh, because they had to bring the equipment in and take it back. So, um, you know, I think I had nine days to shoot the movie. And, um, and you know, when you were talking about no experience, I had been on eight movie sets or whatever up until this time, but I had really never thought about directing at all. And... And I, I remember the first day I was completely overwhelmed, com- just completely overwhelmed. And um, part of that was the, the planning that I had done was mostly about the dance sequences and not about the first day of shooting. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, I think most first-time directors do get overwhelmed, but, uh, boy, it was uh, – it was, that's the only word I can use to describe it. You know, you have 18 people coming up to you constantly saying, should this be red or blue? Should this be in that corner or over against the wall? Uh, how, you know, where do you want the camera? Where do you want this? It's, uh, but I got through it. <laughs> I got through it. And you got to act, you have to direct a few action sequences along the way, such as, um, one where a man on a motorcycle drives through the desert and then has his face blown off. Yeah, actually, um, that was just, I mean, and again, you know, this action stuff is really just like boys with toys. Um, I mean, stuntmen and sex guys are really just the way we were when we were about 11 years old. And, you know, we get to blow stuff up and, you know, drive around uh, doing this cool thing. The thing that was neat about that car that just went flying through the desert, you know, flipping over many times um, was it, it was a technique that I don't know if they I don't think they even use it anymore. Maybe they do, but it's, it can be dangerous. It's called a cannon roll, and they actually build a cannon into the back of the car, facing down, and they put a piece of a telephone pole in there with a big explosive charge. So you know, so you basically have this big bomb in the back of your car. Oh. <clears throat> You get the car skidding sideways, and you fire this cannon, which shoots this telephone pole down into the ground, which flips the car up in the air. And uh, so that was just loads of fun to do that. Um, (laughs) And you were saying – oh, oh, no, go on. The other thing was these um, stuntmen, uh, these were two guys named – well, there was this guy, Perry Genovese, who was the stunt coordinator. But the guys behind the special effects and who had really had a lot of experience with stunts were these guys named the Kirby brothers, two brothers. And um, and they had just done a lot of stuff on their own because they were in... Munch? had never seen before that we used in the film one of them was in uh, like with the dancers and things they would take a shotgun with a blank in it and put condoms filled with blood in it and actually fire the condoms out uh you know causing this blood to you know appear on the person and and this way you didn't have to use a squib (laughs) and uh they had come up with this uh face plate in the motorcycle helmet effect and uh, they had showed it to me, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. Let's, uh, let's do that. And the actor that played that role in the movie was my brother. Didn't know that. Piece of trivia there, yeah. Yeah. And then, by the way, these clips, for those listening, are going to be linked on the yourvideostoreshelf.com website. So I'm going to talk about them. There are two other scenes in uh, The Great Dancer Die. I'll go with this one first. The famous scene, or famous in my own mind, scene where there are women dancing and then squibs explode. 